All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be uh, hearing a reading of chapters 7, 8, and 9 of The Green Mile, Part 2, The Mouse on the Mile. But just before we do that, a recap of chapters 4, 5, and 6. Chapter 4 opens the day with us being at the day before Arlen Bitterbuck's execution, and Paul and his team are running through a rehearsal of what's going to happen during the quote unquote main event. Uh, they run through every step, meticulously paying attention to all the details, old toot toot, adding some levity and humor into the situation, much to Paul's chagrin. And rehearsal ends with a visit from Steamboat Willie. Chapter five is the day of Arlen Bitterbuck's execution itself, where walk through the quick version of the execution of Arlen Bitterbuck, and which goes off pretty much without a hitch, except for the fact that one of his braids gets fire. And as the body is being taken out of the prison, Percy gives us another glimpse into his warped mentality by slapping the chief as they're wheeling him out. And then chapter six is very brief where Paul takes the time to remind us uh, who the story is about and why he's telling the story by drawing our attention back to where we left John Coffey before we started off on this rather important tangent about the story of Steamboat Willie slash Mr. Jingles. So without further ado, chapters seven, eight, and nine of The Green Mile, book two, The Mouse on the Mile. Stephen King, The Green Mile, Part 2, The Mouse on the Mile, Chapter 7. So the chief burned and the president walked as far as Sea Block, anyway, which was home to most Coal Mountain's 150 lifers. Life for the press turned out to be 12 years. He was drowned in a prison laundry in 1944. Not the Coal Mountain prison laundry. Coal Mountain closed in 1933. I don't suppose it mattered much to the inmates, walls as walls, as they can say. And old Sparky was every bit as lethal in his own little stone death chamber, I reckon, as he'd ever been in the storage room at Coal Mountain. As for the prayers, someone shoved him face, face first into a vat of dry cleaning fluid and held him there. When the guards pulled him out again, his face was almost entirely gone. They had to ID him by his fingerprints. On the whole, he might have been better off with old Sparky. But then, he never would have had those extra 12 years, would he? I doubt he thought much about that, though. In the last minute or so of his life, when his lungs were trying to learn how to handle hexic and lie cleanser, they never caught whoever did for him. By then, I was out of the corrections line of work, but Harry Tellerwinger wrote and told me. He got commuted, mostly because he was white, Harry wrote, but he got it in the end, just the same. I just think of it as a long stay of execution that finally ran out. There was quiet, it was quiet time for us in the E-block once the press was gone. Harry and Dean were temporarily resigned, and it was just me Brutal and Percy on the Green Mile for a little bit, which actually meant just me and Brutal, because Percy kept pretty much to himself. I tell you, that young man was a genius at finding things not to do. And never so often, but only when Percy wasn't around, the other guys would show up to have what Harry liked to call a good gab. On many of these occasions, the mouse would also show up. We'd feed him, and he'd sit there eating, just as solemn as Solomon, watching us with his bright oil spot eyes. That was a good few weeks, calm and easy, even when Percy's more than occasional carpet. But all good things come to an end. And on a rainy Monday in late July, have, you, have I told you how many rainy and dark that summer was? I found myself sitting on the bunk of an open cell and waiting for Edward Delaro. He came with an unexpected bang. The lower door leading into the exterior yard slammed open, letting in a flood of light that was confused, rattle and chains 
and frightened voice babbling away in a mixture of English and Cajun French. The poor de of the corners of Cold Mountain used to call it De Bayou. And Brutal hollering, hey, quit it. For Christ's sake, quit it, Percy. I've been half dozing on what was to come Devereaux's bunk. But I was up in a hurry, my heart staggering away, my heart in my chest. Noise of that kind on E-Block almost never happened until Percy came. He brought it along with him, like a bad smell. Come on, you fucking French fried faggot, Percy yelled, ignoring Brutal completely. And here he came, dragging a guy much bigger than a bullpen by one arm. In the other hand, Percy had his baton. His teeth was barred in a strained grimace, and his face was bright red. Yet he did not look entirely unhappy. Devereaux was trying to keep up with him, but he had the leg irons on, and no matter how fast he shuffled his feet, Percy pulled him along faster. I sprang out of the cell just in time to catch him as he fell, and that was how Dell and I were introduced. Percy rounded on him, but time raised, and I held him back with one arm. Brutal came puffing up to us, looking as shocked and nine plus as by all this as I felt. Don't let it hit me again no more, Monsieur, Dev Devereaux Bryant. See the spot, see the spot. Let me at him, let me at him, Percy cried, lunging forward. He began to hit Devereaux's shoulders with his baton. Devereaux held his arms up, screaming, and the stick went whop, whop, whop against the sleeves of his blue pl prison shirt. I saw him that night with a shirt off, and that boy had bruises from Christmas to Easter. Seeing them made me feel bad. He was a murderer and nobody's darling, but that's not a way we did things on E-Block. Not until Percy came anyhow. Whoa, whoa, I roared. Quit that. What's this all about anyway? I was trying to get my body between Devereaux and Percy's, but it wasn't working very well. Percy club continued to flail away, now on one side of me and now on the other. Sooner or later, he was going to bring one down on me instead of his intended target. And then there was going to be a brawl right here in this quarter, no matter who his relations were. I wouldn't be able to help myself and Brutal was apt to join in. In some ways, you know, I wish we'd done it. It might have changed some things that happened later on. Fucking faggot, I'll teach you to keep your hands off me, you lousy bump puncher. Wop, wop, wop. And now Devereaux was bleeding from one ear and screaming. I gave up trying to shield him, grabbed him by one shoulder, and hurled him into his cell, where he went sprawling on the bunk. Percy darted around me and gave him a final whop on the butt, one to go on, you could say. Then Brutal grabbed him, Percy, I mean, by the shoulders and hauled him across the quarter. I grabbed the cell door and ran, ran it shut on the step in his tracks. Then I turned to Percy, my shock and bewilderment at war with pure fury. Percy had been around about several months at that point long enough for all of us to decide we didn't like him very much. But that was the first time I fully understood how out of control he was. He stood watching me, not entirely without fear. He was a coward at heart. I never had, I never had any doubt about that, but still confident that his connection would protect him. And that he was correct. I suspect there are people who wouldn't understand why that was. Even after all I've said, but they would have to be people who only knew the phrase Great Depression from the history books. If you were there, it was a lot more than a phrase in a book. And if you had a steady job, brother, you'd do almost anything to keep it. The color was fading out of Percy's face a little bit by then, but his cheeks were still flushed, and his hair, which was usually swept back and gleaming with brilliantine, and tumbled over his forehead. What in the Christ was all that about, I asked. I never have, and I never, and I had never had a prisoner beaten on my block before. Little fag bastard tried to cop my joint when I pulled him out of the van, Percy said. He had it coming, and I'll do it again. I looked at him too flabbergasted by four words. I couldn't imagine the most predatory homosexual on God's green earth doing what Percy had just described. Preparing to move in the crossbar apartment on the Green Mile did not, as a rule, put even the most deviant prisoners in a sexy mood. I looked back at Devereaux, cowering at his bunk with his arms still up to protect his face. 
There were cuffs on his wrists and chains running between his ankles. Then I turned to Percy. Get out of here, I said. I want to talk to you later. Is this going to be your in your report, he demanded. Because if it is, I can make a report of my own, you know. I didn't want to make a report. I only wanted him out of my sight, and I told him so. The matter's closed, I finished. I saw Bruno looking at me disapprovingly, but ignored it. Go on, get out of here. Go over to Amid and tell him that you are supposed to read letters and help with the package room. Sure, he had his composure back, or the crack-headed arrogance that served him as composure. He brushed his hair back from his forehead with his hands, soft and white and small. The hands of a girl in the early teens, you would have thought, and then approached the cell. Devereux saw him, and he cringed back even further on his bunk, gibbering in a mixture of English and stew pot French. Ain't done nothing with you, Pierre, he said, then jumped as one of the batons. Brutal's huge hand fell on his shoulder. Yes, you are, Brutal said. Now go on, get in the breeze. You don't scare me, you know, Percy said. Not a bit. His eyes shifted to me. Either of you. But we did. You could see that in his eyes as clear as day. And it made him even more dangerous. A guy like Percy doesn't even know himself what he means to do from minute to minute and second to second. What he did right then was turn away from us and go walking up the corner in long, arrogant strides. He had shown the world what happened when scrawny, half-bald little Frenchman tried to cop his joint. By God and he was leaving the field of victor. I went through my set speech all about how we had the radio, make-believe ballroom in our gal Sunday, and how we'd treat him, Jack, if he did the same for us. That little homely was not what you'd call one of my great successes. He cried all the way through it, sitting huddled up in the front of his bunk, as far as he could get without actually fading into the corner. He cringed every time I moved, and I don't think he heard one word in six. Probably just as well. I don't think that particular harmony made a whole lot of sense anyway. Fifteen minutes later, I was back at the desk, where shaking, looking Brutus how was sitting and licking the tip of his pencil. We kept at the visitor's book. Will you stop that before you poison yourself, for God's sake, I asked. Christ, oh my Jesus, he said, putting the pencil down. I never want to have another hurrah like that with a prisoner coming on the block. My daddy always used to say things come in threes, I said. Well, I hope your daddy was full of shit on that subject, Buddha said, but of course he wasn't. There was a squall when John Coffee came in, and a form blown storm when Wild Bill joined us. It's funny, but things really do seem to come in threes. The story of our introduction to Wild Bill, how they came into the mile, Trying to commit murder is something I'll get shortly. Fairly, fair warning. What's this about Devereux Cope and his joint, I'd ask. Brutal snorted. He was ankle chained and the old person was just pulling him too fast, that's all. He stumbled and started to fall and he got out of the stagecoach. He put his hands out, same as anyone would when they start to fall, and one of them brushed the front of Percy's pants. It was a complete accident. Did Percy know that, do you think? I asked. Was he maybe using it as an excuse just because he didn't? He felt like welling on Devereaux a little bit, showing him who's boss and shooting match around here? Brutal nodded slowly. Yeah, I think that was probably it. We have to watch him then, I said, and ran my hands through my hair, as if the job wasn't hard enough. God, I hate this. I hate him. Me too. You want to know something else, Paul? I don't understand it. He got connections. I understand that, all right. But why would he use them to get a job on the green fucking mile? Anywhere in the state pen, for that matter. Why not as a page in the state senate? Or guy who makes the lieutenant governor's appointments? Surely his people could have gotten him something better if he had asked them. So why here? I shook my head. I didn't know. There were a lot of things I didn't know then. I suppose I was naive. Now you can ask your questions for chapter seven. Chapter eight. 
After things that went back to normal again, for a while at least, down in the country seat, the state was preparing to bring John Coffey to trial. And the Terrebus County Sheriff, Homer Cribbis, was poo-pooing the idea that lynch mob might hurry the justice along a little bit. None of that mattered to us on E-Block. No one paid much attention to the news. Life on the Green Mile was, in a way, like life in a soundproof room. From time to time, you heard mutterings that were probably explosions on the outside world, but that was about all. They wouldn't hurry with John Coffey. They wanted to make damn sure of him. On a couple of occasions, Percy got to rag and Devereaux, and the second time I pulled him aside and told him to come up to my office. It wasn't my first interview with Percy on the subject of his behavior, and it wouldn't be the last, but it was prompted by what was probably the clearest understanding of what he was. He had the heart of a cruel boy who goes to the zoo, not so he can study the animals, but so he can throw stones at them in their cages. You stay away from him now, you hear, I said. Unless I give you a specific order, just stay the hell away from him. Percy combed his, bl- his hair back, then patted at it with his sweet little hands. That boy just loved touching his hair. I wasn't doing nothing to him, he said, only asking how he felt and you turned up some babies, it's all. Percy gave me a round-eyed, innocent stare. You quit with it, or there'll be a report, I said. He laughed. Make any report you want, he said. Then I'll turn around and make my own. Just like I told you when I came in, we'll see who comes off the best. I leaned forward, hands folded on my desk, and spoke in a tone I hoped would sound like a friend being confidential. Brutus Howell doesn't like you much, I said. And when Brutus doesn't like someone, he has been known to make his own report. It isn't much shakes with a pen, and he can't quit from licking that pencil. So he's apt to report with his fist, if you know what I mean. Percy's complacent little smile faltered. What are you trying to say? I'm not trying to say anything. I have said it. And if you tell any of your... Friends, about this discussion, I'll say you made the whole thing up. I looked at them all wide-eyed and earnest. Besides, I'm, I'm trying to be your friend, Percy. A word to the wise is sufficient, they say. And why would you want to get into it with Devereaux in the first place? He's not worth it. And for a while that worked. There was peace. A couple of times I wasn't even able to send Percy with Dean or Harry when Devereaux's time to shower. It rolled around. We had the radio at night. Devereaux began to relax a little into the scant routine of E-Block. And there was peace. Then one night, I heard him laughing. Harry Turner was on the desk, and soon he was laughing too. I got up and went down to Devereaux's cell to see what was possibly had to laugh about. Look, Captain, he said when he saw me. I done tamed me a mouse. It was Steamboat Willie. He was in Devereaux's cell. More, he was sitting on Devereaux's shoulder and looking calmly through the bars at us with his little oil drop eyes. His tail was curled around his paws, and he looked completely at peace. As for Devereaux, friend, you wouldn't have known it was the same man you had sat cringing and shuddering at the foot of his bunk not a week before. He looked at my daughter. He looked like my daughter used to on Christmas morning, when she came down the stairs and saw the presents. What's this, Devereaux said. The mouse was sitting on his right shoulder. Devereaux stretched out his left arm. The mouse scampered up the top of Devereaux's head, using the man's hair, which was thick enough in the back at least, to climb up. Then he scampered down the other side. Devereaux giggling at his tail tickled the side of his neck. The mouse the mouse ran all the way down his arm to his wrist, then turned, scampered back up to Devereaux's left shoulder, and curled his tail around his feet again. I'll be damned, Harry said. I trained him to do that, Devereaux said proudly. I thought in a pig's ass you did, but kept my mouth shut. His name is Mr. Jingles. Nah, Harry said good-naturedly. It's Steamboat Willie, like in the picture show. Boss Powell named him. Is Mr. Jingle, Devereaux said. And any other subject he would have told you that shit was Shinola, if you wanted him to. 
when on the subject of the mouse's name, he was pretty adamant. He whispered in my ear, Captain, can I have a box for you? Can I have a box for my mouse so he can sleep in here with me? His voice began to fall into weird in tones I had heard a thousand times before. I put him under my bunk, and he'd never be as scared or troubled to no one. English gets a hell of a lot better when you want something, I said, stalling for time. Oh, Harry muttered, nudging me. Here comes trouble. But Percy didn't look like trouble to me. Not that night. He was running his hands through his hair or fiddling with his baton of his. And the top button of his uniform was actually undone. It was the first time I seen him that way. And it was amazing what a change a little thing like that could make. Mostly, though, what struck me was the expression on his face. There was a calmness there. Not serenity, I don't think. Percy Whitmore had a siren bone in his body. But the look of a man who had discovered he can wait for things he wants. It was quite a change from the young man I had to threaten with Brutus Howe's fits only a few days before. Devereux didn't see the change, though. He cringed against the wall of his cell, drawing the knees up to his chest. His eyes seemed to grow until they were t taking up half his face. Mouse scrambled up on his ball plate and sat there. I don't know if he remembered that he also had reason to distrust Percy, but it certainly looked as if he did. Probably was just smelling the little Frenchman's fear and reacting off that. Well, well, Percy said. Looks like you found yourself a friend, Eddie. Devereux tried to plot and reply some hollow defiance about what would happen to Percy if Percy heard his new pal would have been my guess. But nothing came out. His lower lip trembled a little, but that was all. On top of his head, Mr. Jingle wasn't trembling. He sat perfectly still with his back feet in Devereux's hair, and the front one sprayed on Devereux's bald skull, looking at Percy, seeming to size him up, the way he sized up an old enemy. Percy looked at me, isn't that the same one I chase? The one that lives in the, in the restraint room? I nodded. Had an idea Percy had seen the newly named Mr. Jingles since the last chase, and he showed no signs of wanting to chase it now. Yes, that's the one I said. Only Devereux there said his name is Mr. Jingles, not Steamboat Willie. Said the mouse whispered it in his ear. Is that so, Percy said. Wonders never cease, do they? I half expected him to pull out of the time and start tapping it against the bars just to show Devereux who was boss. But he only stood there with his hands on his hips looking in. And for no reason I could have told you in words, I said, Devereux, there was just asking for a box, Percy. He thinks that mouse will sleep in it, I guess, that he can keep it for a pet. I loaded my voice with skepticism and seemed more than it's saw Harry looking at me in surprise. What do you think about that? I think I'll probably sh shit up his nose some night while he's sleeping, then run away, Percy said evenly. But I guess that's the French boy's lookout. I seen a pretty nice cigar box on Two Toots cart the other night. I don't know if he'll give it away, though. Probably want a nickel for it, maybe even a dime. Now, I did risk a glance at Harry and saw his mouth hanging open. That wasn't quite like the change you'd ever need to scrooge on Christmas morning after the ghost had their way with him, but it was a damn close. Percy leaned closer to Devereux, putting his face between the bars. Devereux shacked back with further. I swear to God they would have melted into that wall if he had been able. You got a nickel or maybe much of the dime to pay for a cigar box you lagoon me at? I got four pennies, Devereux said. I give them for a box if a good one, or a boom. I'll tell you what, Percy said. If that toothless old poor master will sell you that Corona box for four cents, I'll sneak some cotton batting out of the dispensary to line it with. We'll make us a regular Moose Hilton before we're through. He shifted his eyes to me. I'm supposed to write a switch room report about bitter luck, he said. Is there some pins in your office, Paul? Yes, indeed, I said. Forms, too. Left hand, top drawer. Well, that's aces, he said, and we're swaggering off. Harry and I looked at each other. 
Is he sick, do you think, Harry? Yes. Maybe went to his doctor and found out he's only got three months to live. I told him I didn't have the slightest idea of what was up. It was the truth then and for a while after, but I found out in time. And a few years later, I had an interesting supper table conversation with Hal Moore's. By then, we would could talk freely, but with him being retired and me being at the boys' correctional, it was one of those meals where you drink too much and eat too little and tell them to get loose. Hal told me that Percy had been in a complaint, been in to complain about me and about life on the mile in general. This was just after Devereaux came back on the block and Bruder and I had kept Percy from beating me half to death. Where that grip Percy was the most was telling him to get out of my sight. He didn't think a man who was related to the governor should have been put up with a talk like that. When Morris told me he had stood Percy off for as long as he could, and when it became clear to him that Percy was going to try pulling some strings to get me reprimanded and moved to another part of the prison, at the very least, he, Morris, had pulled Percy into his office and told him that he quit rocking the boat. Morris would make sure that Percy was out front for Devereaux's execution. That it would, in fact, be placed right beside the chair. I would be in charge, as always, but the witnesses would know that to them it would look like as if per Mr. Percy Whitmore was boss of the coalition. Moores wasn't promising any more than he we already discussed, and I go along with it, but Percy didn't know that. He agreed to leave off his threats to have me reassigned, and the atmosphere on E Block sweetened. He had even agreed that Devereaux could keep Percy's old nemesis as a pet. It's amazing how some men can change, given the right incentive. In Percy's case, all Warden Moores had to offer was the chance to get a all little Frenchman's life. That's the end of chapter eight, and you can ask your questions. Chapter 9. Toot Toot felt that four cents was far too little for a prime Corona cigar box, and that he was probably right. Cigar boxes were highly prized objects in prison. A thousand different small items could be stored in them. The smell was pleasant, and there was something about them that reminded our customers of what it was like to be free men, because cigarettes were permitted in prison, but cigars were not, I imagine. Dean Stadden, who was back at the block by then, added a penny to the pot, and I kicked in one as well. When Toot still proved reluctant, Brutal went to work on him, first telling him he ought to be ashamed of himself behaving such a cheapskate, then promising him that he, Brutus Howe, would personally put that corona box back in Toot's hands the day after Devereaux's execution. Six cents might or might not be enough if you were speaking about selling that cigar box. We could have had good old barbershop argument about that, Brutal said. But you have to admit, it's a great price for renting one. He's going to walk a mile in a month, six weeks at the very outside. Why, that box will be back on the shelf under your car almost before you know it's gone. He gave it a soft-hearted judge to give him a stay and still be here to sing, should old Ann's old acquaintance be forgot, Toot said. But he knew better, and Brutal knew he did. Old Toot Toot had been pushing that damn Bible cooking cart around Cold Mountain ever since the Pony Express days. Practically had plenty of sources, better than ours, I thought then. He knew Devereux was fresh out of the soft hearted judges. All he had left to hope for was the governor, who as a rule didn't use clemency to folks who had baked half a dozen of his constituents. Even if he don't get away, that mouse would be shitting in that box until October, maybe even Thanksgiving, Toot argued. But Brutal could see he was weakening. Who's going to buy a cigar, cigar box some mouse been using for a toilet? Oh, geez, Louise, Brutal said. That's the numbest thing I ever heard you say, Toot. I mean, that takes the cake. First, Devereaux will keep the box clean enough to eat a church dinner out of, the way he loved that mouse. He'd lick it clean if that's what it took. Easy on that stuff, too, said, wrinkling his nose. Second, Brutal went on. My shit is no big deal anyway. It's just hard little pellets. Look like birdshot. Shake it right out. Nothing to it. 
Old Toot knew better than to carry his protest any further. He'd been on the yard long enough to understand when he could afford to face into the breeze as he'd do better bending in a hurricane. This wasn't exactly a hurricane, but those blue suits liked the mouth, and we liked the idea of Devereaux having the mouth, and that meant it was at least a gale. So Devereaux got his box, and Percy was good on his word. Two days later, the bottom line was soft pads of cotton, battling with some dispensary. Percy handed them over to himself, and I could see the fear in Devereaux's eyes as he reached through the bars to take them. He was afraid that Percy would grab his hands and break his fingers. I was a little afraid of it too, but no such thing happened. That was the closest that ever came to liking Percy. But even then, it was hard to mistake the look of cool amusement in his eyes. Devereaux had a pet. Percy had one, too. Devereaux would keep his petting, petting it and loving it as long as he could. Percy would wait patiently, as patient as a man like him could anyway, and then burn his alive. Well, have Hilton opened for business, Harry said. The only question is, will a little bugger use it? That question was answered as soon as Devereaux caught Mr. Jingles up on, in one hand and lowered it gently into the box. The mouse snuggled into the white cotton as if it were Aunt Bee's comforter, and that was his home from then until, well, I'll get the end of Mr. Jingles' story in a good time. Old Two Tooth's words, words that the cigar box would fill up with mouse shit proved to be entirely groundless. I never saw a single turd in there, and Devereaux said he never did either. Anywhere in his cell, for that matter. Much later, around the time Brutal showed me the hole in the beam, and we found the colored splinters, I moved the chair out of the restraint room's east corner and found a little pile of mouth turds back there. He had always gone back to the same place to do his business, seemingly as far as from us as he could get. Here's another thing. I never saw them peeing. And usually mice can hardly turn the faucet off for two minutes at a time, especially while they're eating. I told you that damn thing was one of God's mysteries. A week or so after Mr. Jingles had settled into the cigar box, Devereaux called me and Brutal down to his cell to see something. He did so much it was annoying. If Mr. Jingles so much as rolled over on his back with his paws in the air, it was the cutest thing on God's earth as far as that half pint Cajun was concerned. But this time, what he was up to really was sort of amusing. Devereaux had been pretty much forgotten by the world following his conviction, but he had one re relation, one old maiden knot, I believe, who wrote him once a week. She also sent him an enormous bag of peppermint candies, the sort which marked under the name Canadian Mints these days. They look like big pink pills. Devereaux was not allowed to had the whole bag at once, naturally. It was a five-pounder. It would have gobbled them up until he had to go to the infirmary with stumble gripes, stomach gripes. Like almost every murderer who he had on the mile, he had absolutely no understanding of moderation. He'd give them out to half a dozen at a time, and only then if he remembered to ask. Mr. Jingles was sitting beside Devereaux on the bunk when he got down holding one of those pink candies in his paw, munching contentedly away at it. Devereaux was simply overcome with delight. He was like a classical pianist watching his five-year-old son play his first halting exercises. But don't get me wrong, it was funny, a real hoot. The candy was half the size of Mr. Jingles, and his white furred belly was already disdained from it. Take it away from me, Eddie Brutal said, half laughing and half horrified. Christ almighty Jesus, he'll eat till he busts. I can smell that peppermint from here. How many have you let him have? This is his second Devereaux looking at a nervous at Mr. Jingle's belly. You really think he, you know, busts his guts? Mike Brutal said. That was enough authority for Devereaux. He reached his half-eaten pinnacle and I expected the mouse to nip him. But Mr. Jingle gave it over to gave over to Matt Mint. What remained of it anyway? as meek as it could be. I looked at Brutal, and Brutal gave his head a little shake as if to say, no, he didn't understand it either. Then Mr. Jingles plopped down into his box and lay there on the side, 
in an exhausted way that made all three of us laugh. After that, we got used to seeing the mouse sitting beside Deborah, holding a mint and munching away on it just as neatly as an old lady at an afternoon tea party. Both of them surrounded by what I later smelled in that hole in a bean, half bitter, half smell sweet peppermint candy. There's one more thing to tell you about Mr. Jingles before moving on to the arrival of William Wharton, which was when the cyclone really touched down here on Ebon. A week or so after the incident of the peppermint candies, around the time we had pretty much decided Devereaux wasn't going to feed his pet to death. In other words, the Frenchman called us down to his cell. I was on my I was my on my own for the time being, brutal as the commissary for something, and according to the regs, I was not supposed to approach a prisoner in such circumstances. But since I probably could have shocked put a Devereaux twenty yards one handed on a good day, I decided to break the rule and see what he wanted. Watch this, boss Ed boy, he said. You're going to see what Mr. Jingles can do. He reached behind the cigar box and brought up a small wooden spool. Where'd you get that, I asked him. Although I suppose I knew there was really one person who he had gotten it from. Old Toot Toot, he said. Watch this. I was already watching to see Mr. Jingles in his box, standing up with a small Paws propped on the edge, his black eyes fixed on the spool. Devereaux holding between his thumb and his finger, first finger, and his right hand. I felt a funny little chill go up my back. I never had seen a mere mouse attend to something which was such sharpness with such intelligence. I don't really believe that Mr. Jingles was a supernatural visitation, and if I had given you that idea, I'm sorry, but I had never doubted that he was a genius of his kind. Devereaux bent over and rolled his threadless spool across the floor of his cell. It went easily, like a pair of wheels connected to it by an axle. The mouse was cut out of his box in a flash and across the floor after it, like a dog chasing after a stick. I examined with surprise that Devereaux grinned. The spool hit the ball and rebounded. Mr. Jingles went around it and pushed it back to the bunk, switching from one end of the spool to the other whenever it looked like the, it was going over to veer off course. He pushed the spool until it hit Devereaux's foot. Then he looked up at him for a moment, as if to make sure Devereaux had no more immediate tasks for him. A few arithmetic problems to solve, perhaps, or some Latin to prayers. Apparently satisfied at the score, Mr. Jinkles went back to the cigar box and settled down in it again. You taught him that, I said? Yes, sir, boss Edgemore, Devereaux said, his smile only slightly similar. He fetched it every time, smart as hell, ain't he? And the spool, I asked. How did you know he fetched that for him, Eddie? He whispered in the ear and he wanted, he, that he wanted it, Devereaux said sincerely. Same as he whispered his name. Devereaux showed all the other guys his mouth trick, all except Percy. To Devereaux, it didn't matter that Percy had suggested a cigar box and procured the cotton which was lined in. Devereaux was like some dolls. Keep them once, and they never trust you again no matter how nice you are to them. I can hear Devereaux now yelling, hey, hey, you guys, come and see Mr. Jenkins and do. And they go down in the blue suit cluster, Brutal, Harry, Dean, even Bill Dodge, all of them even properly amazed too, the same as I had been. Three or four days after Mr. Jenkins started doing the trick with the spool, Harry Teller went and rammed through the arts and crafts stuff we kept in the restraint room found the Crayola that brought them to Devereaux with a smile that was almost embarrassed. I thought you might like to make the spool different colors, he said. Then your little pal would be like a circus mouse or something. A circus mouse, Devereaux said, looking completely rapturous happy. I suppose he was completely happy, maybe for the first time in his whole miserable life. That is what he is, too, a circus mouse. When am I going to get out of here? He going to make me rich like in a circus. You see if you don't. Percy Whitmer would no doubt have pointed out to Devereaux that he was, he had left Cold Mountain. He'd be riding in the ambulance that didn't need to run his light, light or siren. But Harry knew better. He just told Devereaux to make the spool as colorful as he could and as quick as he could because he had to take crayons back after dinner. They all made it colorful, all right. When he was done, one end of the spool was yellow, the other end was green, 
and a drum in the middle with firehouse red. We got used to hearing Death Row trumpet. Madame, Monsieur, the Madames. La Creek presents the Mills a Mouse a Mesma. That wasn't it exactly, but it gives you the idea of that stew pot French of his. Then he'd make this sound way down his throat, and I think it was supposed to represent a drum roll and fling the spool. Mr. Jingles would go after it in a flash, either nosing it back or rolling it with his paws. That second way really was something you'd have to pay to see in the circus, I think. Devereaux in his mouth, and his mouth brightly colored spool were our chief amusement at the time that John Coff, Coffee came into our care and custody. And that was the way the things remained for a while. Then my urinary infection would have lay still for a while came back, and William Wharton arrived, and all hell broke.